I find it a little bit difficult to do my talk after what we just heard, um, and I please don't take my approach as uh, any statement regarding the importance of what we just heard. I want to share an experience with you that has had a remarkable impact on me as an artist, on me as a human being. Quite frankly, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and yet, in the end, through a shining example that was in front of me for over a year that I never saw, I realized that I truly believe that anything is possible if you're positive. And in the end, this story, as dramatic and radical as it was, it was about love. So this is the guy I was when I left Kong College. Uh, <laughs> you probably didn't think of me as a giant, but that is a self-portrait with a pygmy. That is the tallest man in the village standing next to me. I had to travel for almost four years around the world to, to find that perspective. Um, and I'm very grateful. The challenge with spending time like that and, and learning about life firsthand, which was critical for me to my art, is that when you come back, you can't really get a real job. Um, so from that point on, I shifted, um, and I started becoming an adventure photographer. Uh, I say adventure because I'd wait for the phone to ring, and I was lucky. I found people who believed in me and my eye and my heart and my soul, and they gave me opportunities. And I spent the next uh, 10, 15 years of my life traveling the world, um, trying to translate what I was seeing from the eyes of my subjects. Perspective is everything. We live in a time when people are immersing themselves in this planet in ways that we've never done before. Over and over again, I found myself in this magical spot at just the right time, and I went through this amazing effort to get there. And then at the right time, where it was the sunrise or waiting to the weeks of snowfall and then it cleared, I'd watch an individual do something that, from my eyes, was impossible. In fact, one of the hardest skills I had to learn was to keep my mouth shut because they told me what they were going to do, and I still couldn't believe it. And sure enough, they would pull it up. And it was a result of their ability to see the world from their own unique eyes and believe in themselves and make it happen. An incredible example. Now, I now live in Lake Tahoe. Um, I tell people the reason I live there is because after traveling these amazing places in the world, I got to come back to a place that touches my soul, and I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the world um, because of its change. When I was approached with the opportunity to be involved in the PUSH project, um, it seemed like a dream come true. The PUSH was an idea that was formulated by a couple um, paraplegics, a couple adaptive athletes who wanted to show the world and make an example to great, make, bring awareness to their cause so that other people wouldn't feel sorry for them, but they would take their example and recognize it as a, as, as a great opportunity for them to apply to their own lives. The idea was to ski to the South Pole. I mean, this is the coldest, stormiest, most isolated place on the planet, 40 below zero. They wanted to ski the last degree, 75 miles through a vast wasteland where nothing exists. But there was a lot of variables they didn't know. How they were going to deal with the weather, how to train. They had to design equipment so they would be able to pull this off. So we set off on the year to find answers. And in that year, I got to do which pretty much culminate, culminate everything I had learned in the last 20 years of traveling the globe with these athletes. Here we are in Spitsbergen, which is an island 500 miles south of the North Pole. The sun only set for maybe three hours a day. The awareness was developed of what they were going to accomplish, and they started practicing on the equipment we had. That is a frozen ship in a sea of ice. This culmination of this experience was about as surreal, unreal, and impossible as anything I experienced on planet Earth. And yet, it had all the elements that I've always been looking for to translate in my art, an iconic form. The idea of pushing through space on a mission is something that we as people on this planet have done for thousands of years. Um, it's the same, and yet, perhaps the purpose is different, and the environment. This was a trip to Patagonia, and here we are in this frozen land, and we have steam from hot springs coming out of the land. I thought I was on track. I also knew that what I was about to do on the Antarctic Plateau with my teammates 
was going to be, test me beyond anything I've ever done before. In fact, I committed, and then the more I learned about what I was going to try to accomplish, the more scared I became. Now, of course, I couldn't talk about that, really, and so I trained like I've never trained before. <laughs> my training was catching a tire to myself and going five miles up 3,000 vertical feet four or five times a week to, to just get fit enough so that I could drag my heavy sled through these hard conditions. I mean, let me remind you guys, I'm from Hawaii. <laughs> so my normal clothing is flip-flops and board shorts and, you know, I'm heading to the beach with a surfboard or something like that. So the idea that I'm going to go to this place where the average temperature is minus 40 and instead of having a helicopter or a sled or something else to help me out to gain my perspective as a cameraman and carry all my gear to say nothing about assistant, I had to drag it myself. And it was clear that we could not interfere in this mission because what these guys were going to try to accomplish was beyond anything that, that had been done before. With that said, when I finally found myself on the ice with my teammates after flying to Point Arenas, getting packed up, taking an Aleutian jet to an ice runway um, in Union Glacier, and then taking a small prop plane onto the ice, we are now one degree from the South Pole, 75 miles away. It's 10 o'clock at night, and I was feeling pretty good. You know, I can do this. It's fine. And then the plane flew away. Um, at that point, you don't have much choice. Um, what can I say? We decided it was, this is at 9,000 vertical feet. It's the equivalent of 11, because most of the oxygen on our planet's near the equators. So it was hard to breathe. It was brutally cold. I had 125 pounds behind me that was doing his very best to make it hard for me to move. And I watched Grant in his chair pushing, and I thought, oh my God, what have we committed ourselves to? We pushed as hard as we could for two hours, set up camp, got, got warm, had our food, and then someone asked the question that no one wanted to ask. How far did we go? We had traveled less than a mile. We had enough food for 12 days, and we had 74 miles to go. Um, I went to bed that night not knowing if we were going to make it. When I woke up the next day, I just made a simple promise to myself. I was not going to be the reason why we stopped. The idea of setting after this goal was impossible. There's no way I can ski 75 miles. I mean, I was here, I was committed, and so was my teammates. And when I talked to them privately one-on-one, -on -one, I kind of got the same scope that no one really could see it. And yet we knew day in by day out, if we did everything we could, we would hopefully achieve our goals. I mentioned before there was two adaptive athletes. Well, when we got to the ice, there was only one. And the friend who couldn't make it was a two-time gold, gold medalist Paralympics, John Davis. And in his last training in Patagonia, he got injured, came down with an infection, he was in the hospital, he got weak and was no longer able physically to be able to join us on this trip. So it was very hard. And initially, I took that as a negative. And in the end, I learned to see things in a little bit different light. So the, the final of this story is, is just a beautiful surprise. But what I want to touch on at this point is this understanding that despite all the preparation, I mean, what I do for a living and where I've been and, and all these experiences, this venture to the South Pole on this ice I couldn't compare it to anything. And it was like I was seeing the world with new eyes. Something that I, I pledge myself to try to practice for the rest of my days whenever I can. Because with it became a new way of, of really introspection and really trying to break things down so that I didn't see something and just pass it on because I already knew what it was. Let me give you an example. This is a land where the sun doesn't set. 24 hours of daylight. It doesn't even dip, it just makes circles. So there's no time. There's no night, there's no day. It's just always the same. It's flat, 360 degrees. No matter where you look, it doesn't change. So there's no way to gain perspective of progress. How do you know if you've been anywhere if you can't tell where you've been? <laughs> and yet, to me, there was this timeless metaphor. So I. For days, I'm pushing along, and again, every time I took a picture, I had to go through all this effort to try to catch up, um, because you'd stop, and then, then you know, you're trying to catch a slice of something, but they kept moving. But my, one of the goals that I really wanted to, to accomplish was a team picture that showed me and my, six, uh, my five teammates in this land of nothingness. So, and it, it took about three days of lobbying politically to get them to agree, because they couldn't stop. Again, the challenge is, is you can't work so hard that you sweat because then your sweat freezes. And if you're a paraplegic and you don't have much circulation, that's an extremely fine line. 
So we as a team had to really work around with Grant to keep him moving and as efficient as effective. And every day he did as much as he could to just get as far as he could until he was done. And then the two of the team members would jump ahead, set up camp, and he would roll in. And within 30 seconds, he'd be in his bag getting warm and surviving. On this one night, they agreed. Oops, stepped off the red carpet there, sorry. <laughs> so we, I stood in the center of a circle. I had one of my teammates drew a perfect circle using uh, one of our, our cords. And then I had everybody stand around, and I shot a team picture, six shots that I stitched together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 360 degrees of nothingness. Technology made this trip possible. Um, I've been a Nikon professional shooter for about 20 years, and I'd like to think that if my goal is not to translate visually or to document what we're seeing, it is to emotionally explain what I'm feeling or what this experience feels like. To me, that's a huge difference between photography, and I would argue most photography is not art for that reason, and art. Art has to be two critical things. It has to be original or at least the illusion of originality. Second, it has to touch you emotionally. Well, if you think about it, we are inundated with a digital image in these times. We see hundreds of thousands of images every day on our television, on our phones, on our computers, in our magazines, that we're not looking at it for emotional value. We're processing it for information. So how do you get past that? Well, with that said, I'm embracing digital technology because it allows me to do things that I couldn't do. And I, I'm convinced that if, if, if my whole act is to be part of these experiences, wherever I'm on the planet, and translate emotionally, the biggest trick is not to try to control it or direct it, but participate in it. And by using the modern technology with all its autofocus mechanisms and its tools, I'm able to get tiny little slices while I'm participating. So I had a device made so that I could put the camera into a pouch in front of me. And as I was skiing, I could catch a slice. I shot 40,000 frames on this trip. It's a lot of editing. <laughs> um, there's probably 100 pictures that really convey what I'm trying to say. But I should add one other element. It was extremely difficult every moment to function out there. And what I was trying to tap into is kind of the hidden mission behind what we were doing. We chose the date of arrival January 17th, as the, it was the 100th anniversary when Scott skied to the South Pole for the first time. So the first time on planet Earth that, that man had got, reached the pole. And I kept asking myself, what has changed? You know, what in this experience, as it touches the human being, again, there's nothing else around. That hasn't changed. So how has humans changed? How does it feel differently? And what I came back with was that not a lot has changed, but to make sure, the last few minutes before we got on that last plane, without my teammates knowing, I broke the rules. I mean, we had plans, the amount of weight we were carrying and the equipment we were taking, we had spent months preparing. But something drove me to shift, and I sneaked in another camera that they didn't know about. Of course, I was pulling it myself, but I brought along with me a 1959 Roloflex, which is an old box camera. Anybody here ever heard of film before? Well, this camera shoots 12 medium format shots. And every time I advanced the frame, I'd be so careful that it, it didn't crack and break, or that there wasn't a spark of static electricity that created a lightning bolt on my image. And these were all the advice I got. And those images from, from that camera were significantly different than what I experienced. Now, this is a picture of me. And I have a feeling I'll never shoot a picture of me that I don't recognize myself again, not to that extent. Now, one of our goals, and you see there's another cameraman, is this whole process, we're making a film. And hopefully within a year time, it'll make the circuit of the indie, the indie circuit. And the objective is to draw awareness to two key causes. One of them is a nonprofit called the High Fives Foundation, and the other one is the Reeves Foundation. Um, the High Fives basically supports um, aggressive winter sports athletes who have debilitating accidents, usually spinal cord, and helps them get back and be active. It's an amazing thing, and when you see what these people can do, it really helps you understand why it's worth drawing attention to it. None of this would have been possible on this expedition if Grant didn't have the mindset that he had. Grant Corrigan, 
unequivocally is the most positive, focused person I've ever met in my life. And it wasn't until we were out there that I reflected back on the whole year that I realized that not once did I see this gentleman change. And it wasn't until later that I had a conversation and realized that even before he got injured, that was always the case. Two years ago, he's one of the top snowmobile athletes in the world. He was working on a film, and he did a gap jump of 150 feet. He miscalculated, he compressed on his landing, and came to in the hospital with um, no feeling from below his belly button. At his side was his wife, married for less than four months. They had been together for a number of years. This was his soulmate. And the prognosis was that he should, as soon as possible, accept his condition and move on. He couldn't. And his wife and them basically made a pledge that they were going to perform a miracle and come back. When we went on the ice, I should say that the way they were going to do it was to practice active recovery. She happened to be a physical therapist, and she quit her job and immediately focused full time on him. And he always laughs because he says, you guys all think she's a sweet, really loving, nice person. You should see how she beats me up. Um, and with their recovery, this all was, with, th with that mindset, this positive outlook on life and that love, it all happened. Now, Grant, I want to just explain to you what he did. You have the illusion that we're sliding along. At 40 below zero and a headwind of maybe 10 or 20 knots, uh, it's hard to even think because how cold it is. And it's so cold that there's so much friction that there is no sliding on the skis. So try this on for thought. Go home, find yourself a cardboard box, put it on a carpet, sit in the box and get two sticks and try to push yourself in this cardboard box across the room you will find very quickly that it's probably too hard to even try. And if you really are stubborn, you'll spend an hour and maybe make it this far. That's what Grant did for 12 days, 15 hours a day, six to seven miles a day, and 40 to 50 below zero. And he did it with saying a simple mantra, possibility through positivity. I wrote, skied up to him daily, and I saw him, and I'm like, how is he doing this? It's not possible. It was the mindset. He turned to me one day when I was obviously having a hard time, I was being quiet. He said, I need you to do something for me. I said, what? I said, I need you to say, to yell something loud. I said, what's that? He goes, I need you to say, unbreakable. I said, what? He says, you heard me, unbreakable. So I said, unbreakable. He goes, he stopped. And again, I was told, don't get in his way, don't stop him, let him, otherwise we won't get there. I said, what? He goes, as loud as you can. I am unbreakable. That's what he made me do. I carried that with me. It's why Grant Corrigan was successful. So all along, there was a secret we were carrying. Grant's love, Shauna, was part of our journey throughout the whole year. She was always there. She was never part of the plan, but she was always there supporting us. And what Grant didn't know is that when Johnny had to drop out, we made secret plans to bring Shauna to the South Pole. So when we finally arrived, he, at this greatest moment that he spent so much time working on, she would be there to ce celebrate this moment. And everybody knew, our whole team knew, the expedition company knew. We even had a big gathering at my gallery back in Tahoe where 200 people were standing around speakers listening to us in the tent telling our story. And everybody in the room knew, except for Grant. So here we are. This is, this is the home stretch. That is the US station, uh, science station at the end. And at this point, he knows he's going to make it. He's there. And he turns to Tal Fletcher, the guy on the right, and he says to him, you know, Tal, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You made this all possible. You were amazing. And all I can say to you is that I know this is supposed to be the most positive, exciting moment of my life, but my heart is breaking. My love is not here. She should be here. This is about her. I wouldn't be here without that unconditional positive love in my life, my example. Tal looks at him and says, dude, it's the South Pole. <laughs> Come on. What do you want? You know, this is your moment. Can we, can we talk about this a little later? You know, you'll see her in a week. And, Tal, and Grant was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. So he pushes forward. It wasn't enough just to ski there. Grant put it out there way ahead of time. I'm just going to ski to the South Pole. I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to ski the last distance. Again, this was a guy with no feeling in his belly button when this started a year ago. He was six months out from his injury. When we left for the South Pole, he could feel that feeling down to his knees. He skied the last 100 feet to the, geographic, to, the, to the ceremonial pole. And when he got there, 
the celebration was incredible. There was a small group of people standing around. This hooded figure came up. She pulled off her goggles and her face. And Shauna, his love, was standing there. <sighs> I turned to my other cameraman, Tom, and Tom was struggling. I'm like, what's up? He goes, I'm crying so much that my tears are sticking my eye to the eyepiece of the camera. <laughs> you know, isn't it amazing? The most radical physical thing I've ever seen a human being do was trumped by love. So what do you do after that? I mean, <laughs> wow, right? My answer to you, what we did, we got a great Facebook picture. <laughs> and let me tell you, there's no better place on the planet to get a good Facebook picture. That's a GPS camera, a uh, GPS device, and it shows 90.00.00.00. There's no place on planet Earth that you can get that. That is the geographic pole. And Grant, who's really into his music and DJing and speeding, he wanted to pole dance at the South Pole. <laughs> so he did. And then he wanted to ski around the world. So he skied around the pole. <laughs> this is our team. You'll notice the geographic pole is still in the picture, right? Try this on for thought. We're all standing in different time zones. <laughs> you see what I mean when you rethink what you think the world is? It wasn't about the exotica. It wasn't about the amazing things to see and the beautiful light. It was about nothingness and what we put there. It was the human spirit, the human condition. Through positivity, anything is possible. Because <laughs> it did feel good to be on top of the world or the bottom of the world. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but when you came in, the TEDx team actually put the world upside down. I took that as a personal pat on the back. Thank you. <laughs> so. I've got to catch up with my notes, excuse me. Nothingness. This is the ultimate white room. There's no better backdrop in our universe to find pure perspective. It's not about the place or the time. It's deeper. It's about true, eternal emotion. It's something that has defined us as human beings. It is something that will define us as we go forward. We have a lot of problems on this planet. What are we going to do about it? Here's the interesting thing. Out there, none of your devices work. Okay, we're all about social networking. We're all about communication. We're about the immediacy of times, right? In nothingness, the normal hum of technology is exposed. It's gone. I mean, I didn't have a clock. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have internet. I didn't have any of this. And guess what? I found a balance and a peace that I haven't seen in a long time. I'm, sure of one thing, we all could use more balance in our lives. I know I can. I've been running at a pace I can't maintain, and it's not helping me be a better person. It's not helping me be a, affect the world in a more positive way. So learning to embrace it. Again, without the technology, this trip would not have happened. So it's a huge part of what we can do and how we can see the world and how we can change things. But it's not an end in itself. We need organic matter. We need human interaction. We need to breathe. We need to be present. How many of you sat at a dinner table and, and there's four people having dinner together all texting? What, is this not enough? We have to question what is the role of technology in our world. We have to find that balance. Look, to me, despite all the exotic and incredible things I've got to experience in my world, the the push was really the ultimate human expedition. I, and I, I want to applaud technology because it pushed it forward. It pushed forward this incredible human experience. The message of positivity in these times is critical. Be positive. Dream as big as you can. Change the world.